Monday afternoon, sometime in summer, and excitement ahead for 39 young trainees aboard one of two venturing schooners. Well, they're unique in the, this country, and they're the largest British sailing vessel, and obviously they offer a challenge in that the crew that you sail with are totally inexperienced, and therefore one has a training function as well as, as part of purely a, a, a seamanship function. They do seem to accept that uh, this is going to be a pretty tough couple of weeks, not moan about it and get on with it. And uh, they most of them give up their all. You know, they, they really put 100% into it. Two things. Right. Two things. Hey. Right, hold it there. Sails, they seem very ancient and not capable of driving the ship. But when you're going about and you lost the wind for a time, you were just in limbo. You didn't seem to be going anywhere. It is a great sense of nature's power once the sails were actually full again. We expose them to the sea and a large sailing vessel, and obviously they do learn how to handle some parts of it that we can't obviously produce. We're not really here to do that, we're to, to provide them, the, the schooner provides an environment of um, living together, working together, and overcoming difficulties together. We're aboard the Malcolm Miller, one of the two topsail schooners financed and run by the Sail Training Association to give young people a taste of life and work at sea. Crews of boys and girls team up to set sail in them through every condition that wind and wave can bring. There can be no passengers aboard a sailing ship that has to be worked every mile of the way, and the schooners certainly offer plenty of opportunity for muscle building. Although these ships were designed to be labor intensive, it's not only sheer physical strength that gets them driving through the water. As any of the girls' crews who take them to sea will testify. Whether boys or girls, training in safety comes before the ship has even moved from the dockside. Right, my darling. What you got on now is a safety harness and a safety line. Okay? They are yours for the duration of the cruise. Whenever you go aloft, that's up this mast, up the main mast, and especially out on that basket, you will wear them. Is that clear? Right. In a few moments, you're going to go up here, you're going to go through the crow's nest, and you're going to come down the other side. Your watch leader will be in the crow's nest, but she's not going to help you. Right. Now, climb in these. These are what we call rattling. Piece of the rope in the... Tied on in the centre, seized on on the outside. As there is a slope on these masts, or on these rat rattlings, if you stand in the same angle as those and try to climb, your knee comes up underneath there, look, each time. So you get nowhere. So you stand slightly out. And if you are slightly built different than I am, all right, as you walk up, it brings tears to your eyes. <laughs> same with coming down. So stand upright, lean slightly back if you wish, simple isn't it, anybody got any queries? Now, Rachel, off, off you go a lot, darling. Now then, anybody frightened of heights? If you've never been aboard a ship before, let alone sailed in no? one, it can be daunting right, to climb you. aloft and look down from no, over 60 right. feet up. Watch it. Thank Nobody you has to do it. Although almost everyone is apprehensive to start with, you could count on one hand the number of trainees over the years who haven't, in the end, thoroughly enjoyed the experience. Off you go. Come on. Thank you. Come on. Right, thank you. Come on. Off you go. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Don't <laughs> Even when we had to just go up to the crow's nest, I was petrified. I was like this. <laughs> but I'll go up there again any time. <laughs> Familiarisation with the ship comes from the moment a new crew steps aboard. We get them on the Sunday, 
and they try on. Four o'clock, the captain has them all down the half deck, gives them a talk, what we're going to do, the training we're going to do, and then we set about them around about half past four. Now then, I get a watch, the captain will have another watch on the beach. Tell them how to steer, what it means by starboard 10, starboard 20, midships, and we get them to steer. When you're aloft and you're working, you only use it when you're stopped, obviously. You then unclip it, you clip it on something. For the first 24 hours after they've signed on, these kids just don't really know what's up. <laughs> they really don't know what's hit them. They've set sail, they've done another drill, they've done firefight drill, they've done man overboard drill. And then at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on the second day, we take them to sea. And working together is a must. The mechanical power on board is reserved for the anchors and cables, and there are a couple of winches. For the rest, it's hauling by hand. It was the watch leaders that told us to hoist the sails and what to do, what rope to pull, and all we did was heave on the line. Miraculously, it went up. Two, six, heave! Two, six, heave! We each had one hour on the wheel during our watch, and the first time I felt like I was driving a car, and it was quite embarrassing because we went about 60 degrees off course, and I chased the compass, which is the greatest mortal sin committed. It takes 10 girls to put up a sail, but it's made that way. After about three or four days, the girls click onto it quicker than the boys. They get into the fact that if they pull together, the sail will go up quicker, more efficiently. The boys are usually 10 individuals until about a week. The girls pick it up in three or four days. You really need to work together. I think it helps you realize how much you do need to depend on people in a team. You can't afford to do your own thing. You have to all work together. I think that's one of the main things I've learned already. When you sense the urgency of the situation because there's a yard of canvas flapping around your ears and somebody's bawling at you to ease off on the throat, honey, you do it and you suddenly realise what it is to work with other people and to work together. The two 150-foot sail training association vessels are almost identical. 300 ton, three masting, profitable schooners. With all sails set, they can boast 9,000 square feet of canvas, or terribly to be precise, which in a good breeze and fair sea conditions can press the ships along at more than 12 knots. With a fresh crew every fortnight, they set course for different destinations, and depending on wind and weather, an exciting voyage of a thousand miles is not uncommon in the ship's logbook. There's a master, chief officer, engineer, bosun, and cook, with a navigator, watch officers, pursers, and watch leaders to back them up. The tradition is to sail everywhere, so there's little chance for boredom, either for the novice or the professional. Like sailing these ships professionally, it's, it's a very interesting job, but I do think it's, it is very satisfying to see youngsters come aboard who know nothing about sailing, know nothing about living with other people, and going off at the end of it saying they've enjoyed it, they've learned something about themselves and sailing on a, on a ship of this size. It's rare that uh, two trainees will know one another. They come from all over the country, all walks of life, and uh, they are selected by a process of uh, showing an interest in wanting to come, and people then sending them. Well, 
uh, I was at school when I was 16, I was a good five odd years ago, when uh, one of my school teachers came round and said that there were ten free places on the Swings and Churchill Malcolm Miller during the Easter, Easter holidays. And uh, I kind of tossed out a coin between climbing the Cairngorms and running away to sea. And so I chose running away to sea and I found myself on a ship with 54 other people going off to uh, France of all places. Chops, mashed potatoes, mixed vegetables, and broad beans. And of course, they're all gravy. Most people, when they come on board, they expect to be fill, uh, filled with porridge and gruel and uh, dead meat. But no, uh, we take a lot of time preparing our food and we spend a lot of money on food. It's uh, equivalent to, I'd say, a good three star hotel because we do put our heart into making the food. Uh, it is quite dangerous in the galley if you don't know what you're doing, but after a while you know what's dangerous, like hot water, it kind of does boil people. And you just get used to the dangerous places, and uh, it has got to the stage where sometimes I had to put on a safety harness in the galley and clip myself onto somewhere to stop myself sliding around, but it is very safe once you know the hazards, as of any other parts of the ship. So there's a cook himself proper, and he's the one who decides what's going to be cooked. And then you've got a cook's mate who does the organisation, the sorting out uh, the sittings, sorting out the laying of tables and washing up, and peeling his buds, of course. You're putting some more food on, on, on the plate, all right? Just tell us the plate that you're putting beans on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we're going back no, out. No, only one more tack. We're going back out to the moment. So we're back in again. Dinner at last, after a busy morning on deck. Time to relax, take a break from heaving at heavy ropes, trimming or changing sails and chat about the trip so far. All one, jump on deck. The work of the ship is arranged in watches, and there's time off for everybody. But the duty, or even standby watch, can be called out at any moment if the master needs to take in sail hurriedly because of a change in the weather or to set a new course. Just now, the ship has to put about to sail off on another tack. This is a moment that calls for some nice timing to keep the ship forging ahead while going through the wind. Get it wrong, with the sails flapping uselessly dead into wind, and she can stop and even start going backwards. Help me! Perhaps of all the passages that the Churchill and Miller make, the greatest call for cooperation from all aboard comes with the competition and fun of the Cutty Sark Tall Ships races. The very mention of these prestigious events, the major race this particular year from Falmouth to Lisbon, seems to put sailors on their mettle. Well, what we're going to do, let them have a good go into the shore, then we're going to go down there just before the coast and we'll jive there. Serious business, this racing, with the master making decisions by the second to be well placed on the line. And run down the line, and then if we're early, we can just lap up. If we're late, we'll bear away. And we'll set the square tops on the rapid. Let's go across again. Starting from a 
different rendezvous every other year, this dazzling display is a kind of United Nations of sail, with ships of every shape and design jockeying for position. Helping to bring this international flavour to the STA are regional and branch committees working all over Britain. The chairman of the committee that runs the Cutty Stark Tall Ships Races, General Sir Patrick Howard Dobson, sums it up. I believe passionately in what the Sail Training Association is trying to do and in the good that Cutty Stark Tall Ships Races do. I've seen them now for two years and I'm absolutely sold on it. It's good stuff. So the great race is underway. This time in unbroken sunshine and fair winds. The tactics of light weather racing can call for as much alertness as a race in a stiff breeze. Some skippers would say more. The steady wind may not call for changes of sail, but careful trimming can make all the difference between winning or losing. So despite the sun, it was concentration all the way, while the master of the Churchill kept up a regular report on their own private duel with the girls aboard the Miller. OK, well done, England. Pretty well at the start, except for the problem with the mizzen between mast stays off. Our position at the moment, we're 50 miles off Ushant, just getting round there. We sailed 90 miles from the start, so that gives us 647 miles still to go. Uh, you can see over there's the Malcolm Miller. She's 4.3 miles from us at the moment. We were ahead of her, then she caught up during the first, but the middle watch did a bit better and um, gained a bit, and then the morning watch have lost a bit. It's pretty level at the moment. Um, the other thing today, it's uh, Tim Havard's birthday. So, Tim. <laughs> so, I'll get my head done, like all yours. Life aboard is not all work, of course. Anyone can take on the challenge of the schooners and know that it'll stand them in good stead. If only to appreciate that a vital part of shipboard discipline is keeping things clean, even after a hard day. It's been very strenuous and very tiring, and at times you just wish you could die and drop down, you know. But most of the time it's been really good fun. We've had enough, just enough time to sleep and get your strength together again for the next boat. I've made an enormous amount of friends. It's been a tremendous experience, really enthralling, very exciting, especially last night. Never seen anything quite like it. A challenge, definitely, because when we had the square sail up and the ship's underway and you're out on the yard, it's definitely something I'd like to experience again. It's a really great sensation. Poor lookout. Coming up to the finishing line after a close race, has its own special rewards, even if it does happen in the middle of the night. It's on for longer than it's off. Somewhere find the port. That lighthouse is the finishing line. Well, that is due north. Zero one three. Flare is used to indicate the ship's position. So it's all over and everyone can relax. On board the Churchill, anyway. It's surprising how a race can set the adrenaline running. Who'd want to miss the moment of sighting a new port, anyway? It could be Norway, Sweden, France, the mountains of Scotland, the attractions of the Channel Islands. This trip brings them to Portugal, and a run ashore at last for a cook-up on the sands of a nearby friendly cove, with the master of the triumphant Churchill still talking about the race. I mean, we have our own little private race with the Miller, but as it regards all the other ships, I don't really mind where we come. Um, the main thing is just to have been here, and it's all about these crewing changes, which we're going to be doing up to Vigo. We'll have other boys from other schooners, and now we hope to arrange barbecues with the other ships and get everybody mixed up together, have Poles on board, Germans, everybody. That's what it's all about. 
you get to know quite a lot of people and yeah you work in a team which is quite good and to me it's quite good to learn a bit of English as well. <laughs> to the side. You know, we're getting absolutely soaked. Um, well, it was false nine, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, well, <laughs> it was really rough. Everyone's trying, rushing around, you know, pulling his sails. I think the sound of the sails is something, something else, really, you know, a huge... Um, Hello, I'm scared. <laughs> and I was on the helm which didn't help from being yelled at because I was going off the course. But I certainly remember that. The wind was on our port beam at this time. About all 39 chaps on the front deck with the number one shouting like mad. The bosun, the captain, everybody, the watch officers. There were 39 of us on the ropes, sweating and cursing like mad, pulling on these ropes with the blocks and tackles flapping about. It's a new experience to me to see the sea like it was. The old sea dogs on board ship, they said it was nothing. But in the distance I could see huge breakers. I was frightened, but I enjoyed it as well. It was something completely different. Every trainee vividly remembers the rough passages, the sense of fright, the discomfort. Even so, Many come back for more. Everybody coped really well, I thought, you know, under the circumstances. I'm very proud of the rest of my watch, actually. When I was on the watch, I was steering at the time. It was at about a force nine gale, and you could see straight along the boat. The boats were leaning off at about 30, 40 degrees, almost sliding off the decks. And you've got the wind almost straight behind you, which is not exactly the easiest place for it to be and the waves 10, 15 feet high over the stern, coming up behind you, and the boat lifting up and smashing down again. I think when, when the going gets tough, it's just about your own sort of, I don't know, self-discipline and making yourself go further. Just the sheer strength of wind and waves together, and you realise how tiny you are in comparison. And it, that, in a, in a way, is quite quelling, and you just do your utmost to get through it, you know, to sort of see your way through it. So, an action-packed fortnight is drawing to a close. The Churchill and the Miller head for home. Sails have to be stowed, and the ship prepared for harbour and the coming of the next crew. It's a time for reflection on the lessons that have been learned from a voyage in a topsail schooner. I was very proud of myself that I'd been able to uh, work on the ship and I felt I'd done quite a good job for myself and the feeling of how everybody pulls together. I mean, there was lads from Scotland, Liverpool, all over the country, even from Germany, who would never seen before, probably won't see again, but, well, within a few days of being on the ship, how we sort of came together and we, the sort of feeling of camaraderie as well, it was just great, it really was. In the beginning, it's very strict, and you all call, a, you call the captain and everything, sir, but by the end, it begins to relax a bit because everybody knows the limits to which they can go without overstepping. Oh, this is an it's a fantastic experience, lots of sailing, but 
completely different from sailing on the number four. In the beginning, the first few days when someone shouts at you, you feel like looking at them twice and saying, hey, don't shout at me. But you begin, you begin to accept it. You just carry out the orders and you all work together and it all seems to work and work, be worth it in the end. No, I don't like heights normally anyway, but uh, I went up there, you, you've got to do the job. Uh, the first time's a bit scary, if you look down, it's quite a way down, it is. But uh, when you're actually on the ship, when it's at sea, you've, if you've got to go up there and pull a sail in, hand it in, you've got there and do it. So you just put your mind to the job and get on with it, and it doesn't seem to bother you in the heights. You, that's what most of the lads said, actually. It's one of a mosaic, one of a spectrum of activities, and I think it's a very good one. I think that there are a great many people, particularly who live in a sort of urban industrial situation, who are not confronted with natural phenomena, whose whole life is surrounded by mechanical devices and a sort of life which is completely controlled by the human ingenuity. If you send them to sea, particularly in a sailing ship, where they've got to depend on the wind and got to battle with the sea, I think it brings them down to earth, or brings them down to water. I remember taking part in a, in a debate on whether sail training was relevant to a modern Navy or not. And um, then when the sail training idea came up and the association was formed, when they asked me, it seemed very natural, having had some experience of what it was, and known the value of it, to try and help them. I think it's been really rewarding. It's been quite tough at times, but I think it's been worth it. I'll do it again. If anybody offered me the chance to do it again, I'd jump at it with both feet. I enjoyed it that much. <laughs>